First off, good morning, everybody. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules to, to join me and Vita North America. Uh, and thank you very much to, to Jim and to Vita for their kind support of our professions and helping us be superheroes to our patients and helping us try and to strive to be better. So thanks very much to, to Vita and Jim, woohoo! So thanks for all that hard work. And again, thank you to you for taking a moment to, to join me. Two segments, I wanna run through a PowerPoint today and then show a couple quick samples at the end. So we, our journey will be about an hour and a half. So thank you very much. Uh, this is always cool. I enjoy doing this and, and sharing my experiences and our efforts as a community uh, of professionals to, to again, help and, and be better and share and share our experiences as we grow through our journey, through our professions and our professional careers. Dentures are like a tort. They're made up of many, many slices, and I want to share parts of my journey with you uh, in efforts to, to, again, stimulate conversation, stimulate thought, and um, in, in more so in efforts to sometimes also help when you're stuck on a case or something that's very frustrating and you're not understanding why, then hopefully you can pull this out of your back pocket. Uh, and again, to, to be a, a superhero for the patient, because that's why we're here. So we're going to encompass uh, different slices of this tort, uh, focusing on the theme of freedom of movement architecture, uh, making it happen and, and integration into our workflow. Uh, so uh, a common occurrence for us is a patient comes in uh, with an existing set of dentures. Uh, typically, that's what they're going to look like. Uh, very worn down occlusion. Uh, sometimes you'll see a hole in the tuberosity and uh, wear patterns over the, the retromolar pad area. So the dentures are quite uh, worn down. Patients coming in usually with the complaint of, I can't eat. Things aren't working so well, so they want a replacement. And we sometimes go into a mode where, okay, we have to you know, open the vertical and put new teeth on it and fix things up and give you a better smile. And uh, we do this and, and so, I'm going to challenge that in a moment. Um, she's in, this patient was in my office because of loose dentures, uh, pain on the flanges, so it was bottoming out, uh, and she just can't chew well anymore. Uh, she was 85 years old at the time, uh, and the existing dentures were 19 years old. So she put this off uh, when you consider that dentures should be replaced every five to seven years-ish. Uh, this was uh, 19. Uh, and she was very concerned about the new dentures being too big and full. And this is why she put off treatment for so long. Uh, she actually came with her daughter uh, to make sure that I wouldn't build a denture that was too big. So she had this preconceived notion coming into the office about new dentures, new denture treatments, uh, and, and what, what she was concerned about for herself. So, of course, somewhere during her uh, time in her life, she's seen... Uh, say her friends or family get new dentures and have them struggle. So she was very uh, concerned and somewhat put off by this. Um, this is a picture of her. So we can see that uh, there is some some um, sagging uh, respectfully of, of the uh, masseter muscles. Uh, so you, you can see the ramus of the mandible uh, in green and in red is more so the draw of where the masseter muscle is. Uh, this is just going to be a quick video of her speaking with the existing denture. So from that, we can think back to you know to our textbook into school where we see that the lip here is is quite uh, flat there's not a lot of support here we have the drooping of the corners of the mouth the teeth themselves as you saw in the video were quite worn flat uh, we would want to put a better smile line on this we'd want to make the dentures bigger you can see here there should be some more support here as well when she was speaking you could see that there was puffs coming from the air uh, coming uh, out of the denture while she was speaking so from a, a clinical perspective, she's overclosed.
And you can see when she speaks, you, you, you can basically see it's, it's almost an end-to-end -end occlusion. Uh, so again, we want to go in there with good intentions and you know, make some corrections here. Remember, the chief reason for her coming in was it was loose, uh, bottoming out pain on the flanges, and she just can't chew her food well anymore. Uh, so from a perspective of every decision in my office is always centered around the main mission statement or main theme of quality of chewing life. So that, that comment or that uh, statement, quality of chewing life, then goes underneath that is quality of, of life because you have to eat to live. So quality of chewing life is our, is a, is our statement that, that we base all of our decisions on of how we're going to assess treatment and go ahead with treatment. Her chief reason of coming in is she can't eat. So we have to remember that food is put in your mouth and your teeth essentially mince the food and pulverize it. It has to mince it almost into a paste. Your tongue then rolls the food and mixes it with saliva to essentially bind it together and to begin the digestive process. Then you need to swallow it. So the mouth is a mince, mix, swallow machine mince, mix, swallow. When you can't do that, then the patient is saying, well, I can't chew well. So that initial uh, you know, uh, comment is always, when they say I can't eat, I always think that in my head of, then they are having issues with the mince, mix, swallow portion of this. There are no symptoms of being overclosed, meaning she's not complaining of ringing in her ears, pain behind her eyes, neck ache, back ache, uh, tenderness in the facial muscles. So she's not symptomatic of being overclosed. Uh, there's no tenderness in the temporal mandibular joint. So remember, every treatment decision is influenced by quality of chewing life. So the case was, was rehabilitated. I used Vita, Excel, and Lingo form. Uh, and this is a video of her done. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of funny because I have to, we, we practice this everybody uh, for the video. So I, I wanted to make sure that she you know, was able to, to speak uh, and you could see I still had to prompt her. Um, what you're going to see from, uh, from this is, let me just get my laser pointer. Um, so she's fuller here. I did a little bit here and a little bit in the corners. Uh, on the video, there's no more puffing of the air coming out because what I did was I just gently thickened this and put a cuspid eminence on here. Uh, but when she smiles, I mean, she she was really clear to me. I don't smile. I I'm I'm not you know I I'm not a smiler. Um, so I essentially is we have to pay attention because the muscles start to sag down. And especially on, on an overclosed case like this, but remember not symptomatic of being overclosed. So our goal is in, in terms of freedom of movement architecture is we wanna rehabilitate this. We wanna give her a big smile line and turn her into that you know, beautiful Julia Roberts smile that we all aspire to be uh, you know, deemed, uh, deemed what we want when we rehabilitate a case. Uh, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm going to say now that from a treatment perspective, uh, and, and again, quality of chewing life, this, this patient didn't want a Julia Roberts smile. And she was very concerned of that, that the dentures would be too big. So I was careful on how much we did. This was more about function and her getting in and being able to mince, mix, and swallow. Uh, and I did a couple of cosmetic things along the way just to try and enhance the situation. Uh, and we went with a mortar and pestle tooth. So it's not uh, a standard tooth, it's a, it's a tooth, uh, the, the lingoform teeth have a cusp, it fits into the fossa. And the idea behind this is more of a mortar and pestle type of approach, uh, and it's very efficient and it helps mince the food. So we, we, you know, we went from sort of that type of a worn down milled occlusion um, to this more, uh, sharper, I'm going to say, uh, and a mortar and pestle. Because we have to keep in mind that the, uh, at the age of 85, her muscles aren't functioning as strong as they used to either anymore. And so her, her typically when you see the lady and, and, and in terms of the frailness at that age, uh, her muscles aren't going to be operating as peak uh, and strong as they used to be. 
So regarding treatment plan, she we, we finished treatment and she was never in for an adjustment. Uh, so from a 19-year-old denture, overclosed, uh, rehabilitated the case. Um, and, and I, you know, from a perspective of the textbook saying it was overclosed, and I, I, I left her, uh, you know, from a perspective, from a textbook perspective, overclosed, but with efficient teeth, did some corrections of what would make it more better for her in her snapshot of time. So my province here in Canada issues me a practice permit every year and the government trusts me to make decisions regarding the welfare and, and the dental welfare of a patient. And so my decision-making process that I stand now and, and forever on recorded basis say is I made these decisions based on quality of chewing life and then I made these decisions on based on, on, on her feedback of what she was wanting out of treatment, but at the same time, what was an achievable goal for us? So our first goal was mince, mix, swallow, and our second goal was to, to, to maybe make some slight muscle corrections, but with the understanding of what was her snapshot of time, which I'll, I'll go through a little bit more in terms of the architecture. So the success of the treatment was also based on the use of a mortar and pestle design and not a, a standard typical 10, 20, 30 degree uh, milling tooth design that, that we find commonplace in the market. So I wanna talk about that a little bit because this was an aha moment for me in my career, in my professional career was understanding the difference. So uh, teeth like Vita Lingoform or MFT or Physiodens are very uh, designed like a mortar and pestle. Uh, they're there to crush and mince the food and pulverize it. Uh, these types of teeth have now eliminated the complaint in my office from I can't eat lettuce. These teeth are uh, have eliminated that complaint. I don't hear that anymore. All other denture teeth on the market are designed on a milling principle. So a 10, 20, 30, 33 degree principle. Regardless of the manufacturer, those types of teeth are all milling. And milling is less efficient. It's not as, as strong in terms of the ability to, to again, mince and mix. Want to talk a little bit about an unconscious bias and circling back to the to the architecture of the case that I that I showed you from from treatment. Uh, we have an unconscious bias that we typically see, uh, you know, clinically when we deal with patients. So an unconscious bias refers to the the tendency just to you know already have a, a preconceived notion or a, or an opinion about something. And that specifically on that denture case was she's overclosed, she's wearing a hole through the denture, I have to open her, I have to give her a better smile. Uh, you know, these are all things that we automatically put in the back of our head when we, when we consider treatment. And we don't consider that, that that's actually prejudicing the, the, the treatment and the, and the patient. So regarding vertical is we typically seek one to three millimeters. So if I would poll everyone listening and I'd say, well, what's, what's uh, freeway space and everyone's going to put up their hand and go, well, it's one to three, Mark. R really, is it? So I'm going to challenge on that and say, there's already your unconscious bias that we put a number to it and we're seeking one to three millimeters for every patient. How do I know that and, and how, why do I feel that one to three is the best for you? So I want to just pull up a couple of articles that I found um, regarding vertical dimension. Um, so the first article was uh, speaking to uh, post extrusion extraction methods uh, regarding mandibular rest position. Uh, so we use uh, methods to rely on, on resting the mandible, uh, craniofacial landmarks, uh, cephalometric analysis, phonetics, and the existing dentures to help determine freeway space and vertical dimension. Uh, cephalometric analysis is the analysis of the dental and skeletal relationships of a human skull. So yeah, I had to look that up too, because um, we don't talk, talk cephalometric very often. And in general, it's we use available techniques. They 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 all have their merits, but the the study found that they're empirical in nature and uh, they do lack scientific support on how accurate they are. So we have to be careful because we typically, when we're trying to find freeway space, uh, you know, there's there's really no f really good single accurate method for obtaining it. So the article was very interesting in terms of just, there's not one approach they said that is best. 
it's probably better to rely on several approaches. This is one that we use common for us uh, that you see is we put the dots and the calipers and we tell the patient to relax when they're sitting there and we're trying to hold equipment up to their nose and we're trying to say relax and blow through your lips and lick your lips and here have a sip of water and just relax your jaw, just relax. Well, <laughs> everybody listening, when someone tells you to relax, do you relax? So I kind of laugh, but um, you know, but this is very common for us. Um, and, and then I want to just quickly talk about another article. Uh, they speak about normal rest position uh, and the teeth aren't in contact. So typically we're seeing that a normal freeway space for human dentition is two to three millimeters uh, anterior and, and excuse me, two to three in the molars and four to six anteriorly. So when we said, well, what's freeway space, Mark? And you go one to three, we forget one to three measured from where? So now you, it's actually, are you looking all the way back in the molar area for one to three, or are you looking at the incisors and the incisor position when you have a patient speak? Because it actually should be four to six in the front. And so this was a good catch for me on unconscious bias and something that, again, I had an aha moment for, uh, where I'm careful of, of how I make that assessment and what relationship. So the reason why I'm centering around this and, and talking about this in terms of the freedom of movement architecture is if you have a situation and a patient, regardless of whether you're a denturist, a dentist, or a dental technician, and this case is back and it's a problem and there's a problem with it. You have to start to ask yourself, okay, stop. Who did we build this for? And did we over open this? Because that's a fair question, because where did you measure this from? So that's number one is, is checking the vertical. Was it too big? Is it too much? Okay, so where do you assess it? Because it should be in the, in the posterior region. When you say one to three, it should be posterior. I remind myself every day there's no nerve into the denture or the denture teeth for a denture patient to feel it. They cannot feel the dentures internally. They can't feel their teeth touch together. They use other senses of to how them feel. So regarding workplace integration is you want to remember an unconscious bias towards freeway space. Uh, where should it be measured from? And is that ideal for that person at that snapshot in time? I'm sorry, but the textbook is just a guideline and sits out on the street most of the time for me. It was a base foundation. But what I've learned now in my humble time, doing what I do now, I'm thankful for that base knowledge, but I've learned now that the world is gray and you have to make these assessments on every patient and fine tune things for what that person wants. So we, we have an integration of mortar and pestle versus milling teeth and where freeway should be measured from. I'm going to take this and expand this topic slightly in terms of the architecture part of this and to aging effects. So as we get older, our reaction time and performance of tasks become slower uh, because our brain processes information at a slower rate. Uh, this is just a comment and a question I always like to ask is, and with everyone listening, in your in your life, in your experiences, do senior citizens handle change well? And most people in a live course are shaking their head going, no, they don't handle change well. So then when they come in for a new set of dentures, why are we changing so much? So, uh-huh, who did we build this for? So as we get older, uh, we have de decreased sensations, slower reflexes, which means our masseter muscles, temporalis muscles, aren't going to be as sharp and prime as they as they uh, used to be. The myelon sheaths that cover the nerves, they start to degrade. So things just aren't as sharp and spry as they were before. So when I make an observation of a patient, I, I try to make an observation of who am I building this for? What do, do I think they can tolerate with the subcontext of seniors don't handle change well? So flexibility now becomes key for me. And, and another aha moment is actually freeway space can fluctuate. So that aha moment is now when I watch someone chew and, and I see that when you chew and you chew your food, you have a chew cycle. So you have a specific pattern that you do when you eat your food. And that pattern then translates into the teeth where 
where the teeth have to function within that chew pattern of that person. So we, I need to now make sure that the cusps and the teeth function and the anterior teeth function within that chew cycle. That chew cycle is no different than your fingerprint or your retinal scan, uh, whether you slouch when you walk, how you walk, the, this, you have a chew cycle. So here's a patient. Let me show you their chew cycle. So this was an this is an upper denture, uh, lower cast frame partial, pre-end extension on the lower, and you can watch. So this video was sent to me. Look at this thing. So you see how they're chewing with a teardrop? Look at that, man. That's awesome. So it's a complete upper denture, lower cast frame. And you can see there's an actual cycle. There's a teardrop cycle. Now, because I'm showing you this uh, online, um, you're not going to see it as well. But on my computer, actually, when he talks, you can actually see this split. Uh, and he's been breaking the upper denture all the time. And so you can see it split here. Um, it's, it's cool to watch this in action. So everybody has a chew cycle, okay? So now you have to remember to set teeth within that chew cycle. And you're gonna say, but Mark, I don't see the patient. I'm a technician. How do I know the chew cycle? Well, okay. So now you know one exists. You have to imagine it's like a teardrop. So now you don't want to lock the bite in. And the older the denture you're replacing, the flatter the teeth, the more holes or worn in pattern, the chew cycle becomes more horizontal because the patient has to then mill it to be able to eat. So what's happening here is that the teeth are wearing down and for you to be able to, to mince the food, you have to squeeze it together and mill it like you would rubbing it between your fingers. It's like milling flour. So what happens then is when you rehabilitate the case, you wanna make sure that the contacts are lying in the middle of the tooth and you're not hitting the guiding planes of the tooth because that's where you will then dislodge the denture, chip teeth, cause stresses within the denture that cause it to to splay so this is what freedom and so this is what freedom and centric looks like on on an articulator and with appropriate denture teeth so i can hold in centric and i can wiggle it in centric and now we're doing classical working and balancing contacts but now the the teeth have the ability to rock in centric so that's the freedom of movement architecture and part of that. So that's freedom in movement where we actually can hold our teeth together and we can wiggle them in centric. Our denture patient, remember, has no nerves to their teeth, so they can't feel it. So we've forgotten about this with denture teeth uh, and, and we've forgotten about the phenomenon of freedom in centric. So we have a unique chew cycle where the patient has a unique chewing so when i look at them and i try to assess their chew cycle i have to make sure that the teeth function within that chew cycle because that's going to reduce ill fit and then i want to make sure that they have freedom and centric so for the first case that i showed you at the beginning of the presentation where she has a very worn down occlusion i make sure that i have a really good freedom and centric and that it it can wiggle in there that's really, really important. The other assessment tool that I use is I take a look at the patient that I'm treating and I look at their arm. So I look at their arm and I'm looking at their skin. So here's a patient that, you know, I'm gonna say, you know, has normal skin. And then I'm gonna show you this patient and you can see now that things are starting to, what do you see? Well, it's thinning and I can see through it. Okay, you can see the arthritis, you can see bruising, so I know that she's now bruising easier. Uh, and she has glitter nail polish. So she's 80 plus years old and still goes to the salon. So this is awesome. She's spry still. Um, and so that also tells me about her adaptability. So she, she does some have some adaptability left. But you can see from the skin here, it's starting to thin and bruise. And so what I'm doing is I'm using the... Um, the skin exteriorly of a person to show me what's going on interiorly. So here's another patient. You can really, again, see the veins. You can see some bruising. Things are starting to, to thin and you can see through it regardless of, of skin color. 
And then I'm going to show you this patient. You can see very frail, very thin, lots of bruising. So she's a very frail lady. So this is telling me that she's going to have a heck of a time adapting to change. And so on this specific case, she was having her, her teeth removed and an immediate made. So I'm going to be extremely careful about the treatment planning of this because she's very frail to begin with. So we want to ensure they're normal. We, you want to make sure that when a patient comes in and, and this was taken, so you want to ask questions. So if you're a technician and you've got that case where the dentist is frustrated and, and it's not working, you want to say, look, what, tell me about the person, please. Tell me about their skin. Tell me about, are they frail? Because if they're leaned over and hunched back, like the fellow in the picture here on a walker, don't put them in a dental chair and straighten their back and take a bite. You want to make sure that if they're hunched over, you take the bite hunched over. You want to work within their normal and what's normal for that person. And this was another sort of a, a subtopic I wanted to quickly talk about was we can see now through the pictures here that as we get older, we have a head tilt. And what happens is gravity is now acting on our muscles and pushing our jaw and thrusting or drawing our jaw forward. Um, just through this evolution is as we age. So we don't want to put the person in an upright position and, and take a bite because that's not their normal. When they sit down at the dinner table, their head's going to fall, drift forward because that's what's happening for them holistically. So we wanna be careful when we take a bite. So again, if you're coming back and you have lots of resets and lots of resets, this is part of it that you can say, wait a minute again, who am I building this for? Am I altering this again through an unconscious bias in my office? I need to take the bite in their normal, what works for them. The other consideration now that I wanna tie up and, and bring come back to was this, again, the, the muscles. So as we see these pictures of the person and we see how this kind of goes through and we can see how the how the muscles are starting to lose their tone. So this is where we look at and we say, you know, geez, we would look at this patient and say, look at this, she almost has these jowls here. I need to open the vertical and fix this. And that's what we're thinking clinically. And we have to remember that this is evolution. This is as we age in the aging process and this is gonna happen. And we can see this here, look, that almost looks prognathic and almost looks overclosed, but that's the muscles losing their tone and that's okay. So generally speaking, what I've caught myself is that I am going to probably over open this to try and stretch out the muscles, but that's when that comment comes that the denture's too big. Remember the, again, the, to the comments of the patient at the beginning, the beginning demonstration, when she came in and she was really worried about the dentures being too big and I don't want them to be too big and the teeth are always too big. That's what her friends or loved ones have experienced. And we're thinking we're doing our jobs and the textbook by, by again, looking for that one to three millimeters. So as part of the freedom architecture, this is about assessing it's one to three measured where, a snapshot of time, take a look at the person, can they handle change well? I look at their skin to then get a reference of what's going on in their mouth. So the other consideration that I have is using golden proportion teeth help. And not every denture tooth, again, is made golden proportion. So this comes back to the cephalometric analysis where everything in our skull is mathematically equated and mathematically proportional to each other. So we wanna make sure that we're using denture teeth that are actually mathematically equated. So when we look at the face form and measurements of the person, we're using denture teeth with similar face form, similar measurements, because then it's golden proportioned and it fits better within their system. And so that was another aha moment for me that actually, yeah, this stuff matters and this stuff helps you with treatment. And that's why, again, I'm looking for flexibility out of products that I use. And that's why I use what I use now, because it helps me be flexible and adaptive to the patient's needs and, and my job as the clinical practitioner to help achieve our treatment goals, which was one, mince, mix, swallow. Two, don't make it too big so that's comfortable for you because that was what the patient was talking about and wanted when they came in. 
So it's not just we have to be be aware of those unconscious biases. And my dear colleagues, it's difficult. It's it's difficult because we think, oh, I need to fix that, and I need to fix that, and I got to do it this way. And we have to stop and think about who are we getting, who are we making this for. So again, as a denturist, I see the patient directly. So as a direct healthcare provider. Um, or as a, as a dentist, you see the patient directly. So you get to see that and you just have to look at who am I building this for? And these are some of the key points that I use to, to again, help me decide treatment objectives and, and what I'm going to do in terms of how I set the teeth for that pushed person to make it fit more for them. So I am building dentures for them, not the other way around, not the patient. So I want the denture to adapt to the patient, not the patient have to adapt to the denture. And that's where we cut down on adjustments. As a dental technician, again, you can know that these things exist. You can do some things in the lab as, as we go through the presentation that you can pick up on. So what you're trying to do is build a better product, even in a, in a um, you know, let's face it, in a, in a commercial dental lab where you, you know, you, you want to get the work done, it has to be done in a timely manner. Um, it's, you know, it's a production facility. You still can do small things with your setup technicians for them on, on as, as I'll show as we go through the presentation, little things that they can do to just try and make sure that that denture leaves your lab uh, with the best intents of fitting in that person. Because what you're trying to do is help reduce the adjustment rate that that doctor or, or, or direct provider is going to be experiencing. And when you're able to do that, then of course the doctor is loyal and thinks, oh, my lab builds good teeth. And these are things that, that again, help because the, 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 your customer, the doctor is satisfied, the patient's satisfied, and you have less returns, less callbacks, and less issues from a dental lab. Because let's face it, career costs are expensive. So this all comes back down to, as, as I speak, is you cannot separate the mouth from the person. So what a cool comment. Uh, everything that I'm teaching you basis, you know, and, and that we're going through is based on that. And the mouth and the person are together. So uh, should freeway space change as we age? Can your patient accept change well? And can they reproduce centric every time? Well, the answer to that question now is no, they can't. Because you saw that in the video of the patient chewing with the upper denture and the lower partial. They're going through their chew cycle. They're just eating. But remember, they have no nerves into the denture teeth. So are you able to reproduce something accurately every time when you can't feel the finite touch? No, you can't. So this is why we run into these issues where a patient can't accept a, a new textbook made denture that I did my job. I did everything that I was trained to do. Uh, I did everything that the, you know, the clinician says I did everything that I was trained to do. The lab shrugs their shoulders and says, well, we did everything that we were trained to do. Yet the patient's frustrated and and is having issues. So this is what I want to share with you for those that are listening is, is and that those that do listen in the future when they watch this uh, on the Vita YouTube channel is to take pause and just say, who did I build this for? Why is there problems? And then again, did we change too much for them? So why are they in the office? What was the main complaint? Be aware of our unconscious biases. We have to consider, are they frail? And do they accept the hydraulics of vertical dimension? How much are you changing? You, you can leave them from a textbook, traditional sense, over close, but you're putting in more efficient teeth that mince food, not millet, it's like a mortar and pestle. And you maybe you don't bulk things out as much and, and such. So again, I reproduced that case and treated that case from a 19-year-old denture on an 80-plus-year-old lady that was quite concerned that the dentures were going to be too big and, and not fit for her, and there was zero adjustments afterwards. I just took the time to make sure that I was cautious on what I changed. Um, I, I didn't need to put in a soft liner. I gave her efficient teeth did some corrections in terms of some some of the puffing and things that that now we, we eliminated. Because at the end of the day, do they want to look better or function better? Well, most seniors are going to say function was going to trump aesthetics. And that's why using a mortar and pestle type of denture tooth increases patient acceptance, for, you know, and, and decreases your, your post insertion adjustments. And again, uh, for all the dentists and dentists listening, you know, it, it, if they're overclosed, are they symptomatic? 
Uh, and again, for now, I'm showing you some some tricks that I'm using to assess a patient. You know, are they symptomatic being overclosed, uh, and and should you change it? And 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 is it just the muscles drawing down and their vertical is just opening as we age? You know, things wear out. So we get more freeway space as we get older. So then I'm going to have an increased freeway space, but if that's not snapshot of time, that's correct for that person. Because remember, you cannot separate the mouth from the person. So it stands to reason that my freeway space as a young adult is going to be one to three millimeters in the posterior region, and as I get older and the muscles sag and the dentition changes and, and I draw my mouth more open and my head starts to tilt forward, I'm going to have a, 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 a more. It's maybe now two to four millimeters or, or more. So it's not just trying to, again, we, we have to catch that unconscious bias uh, of, of just, oh, it has to be one to three. Okay. So regarding integration into the workflow is you want to consider those aging effects. And so what I do then is, as I'll show you when we get to the sample portion, is we want to make sure that we're drawing our articulator appropriately, that they can't be reproducing the patient because the patient can't reproduce centric as, as well. We use golden proportion teeth to assist. And so what I've learned now in my 37 years of, of caring for patients and building dentures for patients is the more forgiving a denture is, the more successful they are. Meaning the more I can fine tune that denture to that patient, their chew cycle, their customized uh, freedom and, and uh, vertical dimension, setting it within the chew cycle, considering how frail they are, I've virtually eliminated the need for soft liners in my office. Um, I've, I've cut my adjustment rate down to zero to one consistently. So I've, I've really tried to assess what do I do. And, and now part of that is, is the trend is, is we're, we're seeing a, a strong influence from digital work and trying to build a denture digitally. And regardless of sort of whether you do this or whether the doctor does this or wants to do it digitally or save appointments, there is uh, the value of a digital um, component to this in your tool belt of tools that you use to be a superhero to that patient. So I want to share with you two examples of how I used a digital denture to help. So the first one was a, was a patient with a complete upper denture to lower natural occlusion. This lady was an identified a clencher and bruxer, no question. She has tried uh, every type of remedy from guards, upper and lower, uh, <laughs> hypnotherapy, medications. She grinds her teeth. And so that's really hard on the upper denture. So I used Vitalingo form made from acrylic glass so that it's tough. Uh, but I also made sure that there was lots of freedom in it so that she was able to not get triggered and that it had a lot of, of change and wiggle room in it. I had a valid concern about the wear down of occlusion. So I, what I wanted to do was make a digital copy of it that she wears at night. The digital copy would be made from resin, not acrylic. So I was curious to see how it would wear. So this was her upper denture, scanned it, made a digital, 100% digital copy of this out of tooth shade. So she wears this at night. So if you have a patient coming in that you know is a Bruxer and has been identified as one, why don't we make them a digital copy as part of treatment to wear at night? Because this is a very cost-effective way, not an expensive way to produce uh, a, a denture that she wears at night. And you're gonna say, well, Mark, sometimes a patient doesn't need this, they can take their dentures out at night. Well, she needed to wear her denture because she needed to have that airway support. So we do run into these issues where it's easy to say, well, take your dentures out at night. Well, one, if you remember, and two, can they be supported with their airway? So some people need to wear their dentures, especially in these types of situations with an upper denture. So I was able to make this digital copy uh, and did not need any adjustments. So she wears the two shade at night and the denture during, and the regular denture during the day. And this, what this does is it, it helps prolong the lifespan of the dentures. It's a cost-effective way. 
look, we're just trying to make this happen and, and, and look after people. So I share this with you to say that the digital technology has a place for us to, to use as, a, as, a, as a, again, a tool in our tool belt. Um, the second case I wanted to go over was just a, a complete upper denture. It's implant retained. Uh, it was inserted not that long ago here. We, they, they had four Novolock type implants placed. Uh, the treating dentist said, okay, you're all set. Mark's going to build the denture and he's going to take care of you. Um, so this kind of falls under our, our architecture and making it happen theme of our program today. So that's where we're at. So that's what I saw when they came into the office. And so for, first off, you kind of go, oh, um, okay. So that's what the model looked like. So I did an analog model. Um, to, to take a look at things and of course right away you're going to say well mark uh well we should be changing the angulations there so you should refer back and get them to to put a 90 degree angle on that and change the angulations and i'm going to say you know what i i we didn't do that uh the reason why is if you look at this and the placement of that implant and and now where the forces are directed that is going to be a huge lever because that's where the molar is going to sit and that's where they're going to be eating so on the left side of your screen you can see that there's an implant right around that molar region so it's braced but there's no implant on the right hand side so if i make that correction and i level and 90 degree things out i am putting a huge lever in this person's mouth um, so what we did and what I did was I left it and I did not ask for that correction because when I leave it canted like that, it reduces that stress point and it doesn't act as strong as a lever. Now with the Nova Locks, I knew that I had about a 20 degree kind of rotation and flexibility on them and I used that to my advantage. And so this was sort of the final denture done uh with the Novalox and um, I captured these uh, in the mouth so I had to go in and capture that the heads um of it <clears throat> part of me in the mouth one at a time uh with uh acrylic and doing that in the mouth just given the rotations of it um and so it's a lengthy insert for sure uh for us Sometimes you can you know, do two at a time or on lowers, you can probably do two at a time or something, but on something complicated like this, this was a long insert for me. Um, and the patient's wearing the stenture and, and is comfortable with it. But this is now where the, the pushing the limits comes in with digital. So I did a digital copy of this. So we use the new Vita Dent Disc that's available in the technology. And the question that I have is, is this gonna save me selfishly time and effort? And then in turn, the patient on the insert when I have to, maybe I, I don't have to capture the implants in the mouth or the heads in the mouth. So we did the digital copy and then we did the occlusion. And this is nice because again, I can include Freedom and Centric in this because it's it's now integrated into the software through three shape. And now that the three shape has the implant component, so now I can identify and, and has the components uh, measurements and everything there. So this is something that we can now mill out and I can uh, check the teeth and this is the mapping area of it where I can see the, uh, the intensity of the occlusion and I can adjust and put in freedom and centric and, and all of the little components that, that I want in terms of treatment available into that. Uh, so everything was milled out, okay, and the teeth. And here's the digital copy of it, or the digital version of it. So what I what we did uh, was we placed the heads of the uh, implants into the milled base. They actually snap into position due to the accuracy of this. And so we just bonded it into the denture. Um, and I went right to insert. And so the and so part of it is I did not have to pick this up uh, with um, with acrylic in the mouth. It saved me four hours. Um, excuse me, four hours, two hours. So you gotta you gotta adjust figure about what 20 to 30 minutes per implant. So by the time you prep it and put the collar on and mix up the material and let it sit in the mouth, pull it out, trim off the excess, go to the next one and do it. It's about 20 minutes 
um, per, yeah, 20 minutes per would be reasonable, I think. So this was interesting because I thought, well, if given the accuracy of this uh, and how accurate everything is, I thought, okay, uh, can I go in now and um, and do this? And it was uh, it was awesome. Um, in terms of now, I was able to insert it, and it worked really well. Um, we used the Braidant DDK Clever material uh, to to uh, secure this in. So this was an interesting. Is again the 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 digital aspect of this you know, is providing um, an, a, another tool in my tool belt to provide a, a, you know, a denture that the patient's satisfied with, occlusion that I'm satisfied with, and no adjustments on this case, and I was able to insert it really quickly and save myself an hour and a half, like 90 to, to, to 120 minutes of of time to to insert that case. And the poor patient doesn't have to sit in my office for that long and with their mouth yacked open. So how did I become aware of this all that I'm sharing with you? One reason was, is again, the lady at the front end of this presentation, I would build a set of teeth and I did it to the textbook and then the patient would come back for lots of adjustments and I'm frustrated and the patient's frustrated. And I would check the extensions, I would remount the case, I would put the bite and I check the bite and everything's good. And I put it back in and they're back two weeks later with the same complaints. And I just was frustrated at that point in early in my career because I did what the textbook said. And so began my journey because you cannot improve what you cannot measure. So what's good measure? Well, number one was patient satisfaction and patient complaints. Well, based on what? So I, I took, you know, okay, feedback to me, feedback to the receptionist. But I want you to consider this. How many restaurants do you like uh, and that you never gone back to? Um, and I think that as we speak to every direct care provider, we've got situations where patients come into our office on on a, a consultations and they go, yeah, that's not going back to the other person that I went to last time. Uh, why not? Well, you know, uh, and they, they then they come forward with their specifics. And so I'm just, again, my, my goal is on patient retention or client retention from a lab perspective. I concentrated on the metric of the number of complaints that I had. Um, so the, so I, one of this was the raw cost and adjustment. So I want to talk to you quickly about operating costs per working hour of a dental office or a denture clinic. So I'm going to just throw some numbers out there and then these numbers are tuned specifically you know, to that uh, individual or to that situation. So let's do estimated costs per month. So your rent, utilities, phone, I put at $4,000 a month for an office. So this is again like a denture clinic or a dental office. So say your rent's 4,000, including your utilities and phone. Staff wages, so I picked more of just from a, a denture clinic's perspective of one staff member, you pay them $3,000 a month. The denturist wages, picking, I just picked $6,000 a month. Insurance and professional dues at around $300 a month. Materials and supplies at 2,000. Advertising, I did really low at just 100. But the idea behind this is you would plug your own numbers in. So a dental lab operates this way as well. Um, and, and you have your raw costs. And, and where the company starts to hemorrhage money is re remakes and stuff coming back where you can't bill for. In a clinical environment, such as a denturist's office or a dentist's office, it's when the patients come back for adjustments and we don't bill, we can't bill for them. So when you add this all up, based on those numbers, it was roughly about $15,400. You divide that by 140 working hours in a month. So what I did was I did a, an eight hour day, I took an hour off for lunch, so, you know, so you had seven hours. So that's where I kind of came up with these numbers. So that equated to $110 per working hour. Now, some of you are laughing and going, yeah, Mark, I don't eat lunch. Well, you know, through your lifetime, uh, that's stressful and not healthy for you either to not get a mental break during your workday. Um, so, so I, you know, we try to stop and you have to try and eat lunch for that mental rest. Because again, this is where professional happiness and burnout comes in, where you you burn out from your job and you burn out from this because we're dealing with the same repetitive complaints 
on a daily basis from from dentures. So at two adjustments a day, at 30 minutes each, that's one hour or equating to a loss of $110 per working hour. So I did two adjustments a day because on a denture clinic, they'll see two adjustments a day. A lot of denture clinics are going to see more than that. Um, a busy denture practice, yeah, that's reasonable to expect that. Um, and that was an aha moment for me because uh, preventing an adjustment is a big deal. So the generalities for today's lecture, picking on myself, you know, 25 years ago, I had calculated approximately three adjustments a day when I would uh, total them up for three months. So it, it equated to about three adjustments a day, which is actually 15 per week. That's 60 per month at 30 minutes because you have to see the patient do the work. That was 30 hours. That's one week I worked for free at $110 billion per hour. Now, when I, you go talk to dentists, uh, they know their operating costs per hour. So when I throw that in out in a room full of, of doctors, I hear numbers ranging anywhere from 800 to $5,000 an hour. Um, they know what it costs to operate their business. And if you can save them time and an adjustment time, boy, do you have their attention and loyalty. And as a dentist too, if you're seeing three adjustments a day or four or five, man, that wears you down. You're not making any money. So that's part of it. That's the business application of this. And that's, again, and the stress of those repetitive issues wearing you down. It's hard on you mentally. And it's hard on you as a person to deal with that through your course, so the course of your of your journey as, as through your profession. So this prompted me to challenge, grow, and learn. So that's why I concentrated on the metric. So this was my measure. So why were they back in my office? And that's where I sort of came up with this and why I share it with you because I based it on vertical dimension and freedom and centric and the choose cycle because remember patients will remember you when their dentures didn't hurt them okay they remember that so what are the takeaways well number one age impact on muscle tone the masseter muscle sagging and it's pulling down on the ramus of the mandible but are they really overclosed it's just that snapshot of time that's where they are and we are over opening them head tilt, mandible being pulled forward, frailness, so I use the skin as a judge. And the reason why our skin thins is because at first the, the, the cells are round and as we get older, they go more oval and they space out. So if they're spacing out in our epidermis, in our external skin, then that's what's happening internally. They're spacing out internally and that's why then I know that the skin is thinner in the mouth, it can handle the hydraulics as well. So I want an efficient occlusion. I want them to be able to get in there and eat, mince, mix, swallow, be done as fast as possible so as to not to overload the mucosa and the hydraulics that are happening within the mouth. That's why. And it's a more efficient denture. Are they symptomatic at that current vertical? I assess their arm. The benefit now of a mortar and pestle is, has just been uh, such an aha moment for me. I use that type of tooth on everything and modify it because it's modifiable. I don't have to polish it after I adjust it because it's acrylic glass, it self polishes. That's why we do this. This patient has a chew cycle. We have to make sure we set teeth within that chew cycle. And that's how this works. And if you don't see the chew cycle, now you know one exists. You have to imagine that that's happening. Okay, set teeth within that. The benefit of golden proportion teeth. Now we've discussed your operating costs per hour and a treatment plan that focuses on a custom observant and again, bias free because we all are, we all have our tendencies for unconscious bias. And digital dentures is another tool in your tool belt. And so we do this to be superheroes as we try to uh, help a patient. So I'm going to switch to my external camera. So one moment, please, as I switch over. And I want to show you. Okie dokie. Hello. Okay.
Let me get that out of the way. Let me do this. Okay. All right. So this is pretty standard, right? We have our 20 degree teeth on a standard denture. And as I showed you in the video, it's quite knuck. Well, it's upside down, Mark. It's it's quite knuckle tight. There's not a lot of, of freedom in there. And, and so as this was my standard when I went to school and you want working and balancing occlusion, as you saw now in the, in the diagram or the video of the chew cycle, that's not how someone eats. Um, and now you are expecting all of these teeth and all of these cusps to land and glide and slide and work and balance at the same time on every chew on every bit of food, it's not possible, especially when you have food between your teeth and you're trying to, to mince it. So this has a fundamental flaw that it's a milling tooth. It has to touch together and it has to stay touching together during its cycle to be able to, to, to mi mi mince the food because it's a milling tooth. So this is the, the Vita. And I want to, this is show that that's the fossa and that's where the opposing cusps go into. And the opposing cusps on the flip side of this are here. These are the cutters. So it's the mortar and pestle. And this minces the food as it rests in here. So the functionality of this in terms of the freedom of movement and the architecture that lingual cusp sits into the fossa of the lower the job of the lower is to take and hold it like a bowl hold the food like a bowl and bring it up to this cusp to get minced this is mortar and pestle so it's there doing this okay now you have a chew cycle. So the mandible's moving. So you want it to be able to, just like in a mortar and pestle, when you are mincing and pulverizing within that mortar and pestle, this is the same idea where it comes in, holds the food to get crushed. What you don't wanna have happen now is it comes in and hits here and slides into position. Because again, the patient can't feel the hit and slide because there's no nerve into the denture teeth or no nerve into the denture. So now we can adjust the guiding planes of the teeth here to actually make that bowl wider. So you don't wanna shallow it out because you say, well, Mark, then just put zero degree teeth on here. Well, no, what happens with zero degree teeth? The food comes off, it's not efficient. You want this to pulverize this, it has to stay in the bowl. I'm just making the parameters of the bowl and I'm just changing that so as I said as the patient now is comes in with a denture that's more 19 years old and worn out and holes in it they're going to be chewing more horizontally that's been my observation so I make sure then that I keep the bowl I just am taking away on the guiding planes of the tooth to make this work so coming back to the mortar and pestle designed teeth. So again, you have the bowl that holds the, that holds the food. And now all I'm doing is I can adjust the guiding planes here. I'm adjusting the guiding planes to, again, just make the bowl a little wider so that this cusp rests in there without hitting and sliding into position. So one moment, coming to an articulator, okay? All right. When we learn to move and set teeth, we do this. <clears throat> That's correct, right? This is our standard movement for an articulator, like this, okay? And that's how we check teeth, and we do this. Now I showed you that chew video. Is that indicative of how someone eats? No. I take this articulator now and I do a chew cycle. And I'm moving the articulator like a chew cycle. I'm moving it like this, okay? 
and it doesn't matter what articulator you have. You can move it, whether it's a hinge articulator, it doesn't matter. You can start to do this, because what you're doing is you're taking the teeth, and now I'm guessing what their chew cycle is. So if you know the denture was really worn out, remember I said it's gonna be more horizontal. So I start manipulating this more horizontally, and I am watching to make sure it's not hitting on those guiding planes, and I'm getting a little bit more freedom within those guiding planes, by still having this though, mince. This is the mortar and pestle. Mince it, mince it against air, mix it, swallow it. So I'm able to actually take the articulator, and this was again, as I said to you now in the sample section of this lecture, showing you that I could take it. So some people are more, have more of a teardrop, okay? And then on other people, I go more horizontal, and I'm changing the articulator to suit my needs and I'm mimicking that. So now, from a dental lab perspective, what your setup technician can do is if you know that the case is replacing a 20-year-old denture, you're gonna know that the denture's worn out, so you know they're gonna be milling more, and you know that the patient's chew cycle is going to be more horizontal, your denture technician can now mimic more horizontal, because that's what the patient is used to. And then they can use and modify the teeth slightly to then work within that. And so that when it leaves your office, it's more in tune and you made a calculated decision so that it fits into that person better. So you're modifying the denture more to the person and to the situation when you don't know. So you'd rather always be conservative and err on the side of caution. Uh, and if I do know, so such as myself, or again, a true direct care practitioner that sees the patient, then I'm able to move and hanker around this more. So if I know that the patient drifts and they speak and their jaw moves forward, then I can adjust these anterior teeth as well to that chew cycle. So it's something that can be done and, and changed and modified uh, to the person uh, quite diligently. So from this juice cycle, and you can see him eating, that's my point now of I'm making sure that those cusps are functioning within that teardrop. And I, again, when I see the patient, I can know it and then I can adjust for it. If I don't know, then I'm making an educated decision. And you can make these educated decisions. You just have to train from a, from a lab perspective. You just have to train your, your setup set up people. Your set up people are smart people. They can do setups, they're fast, uh, and, and, and they can have this in their mindset to just remember about this and the chew cycle. Because what you're trying to do then is just save that practitioner an adjustment, okay? All right, Jim, do we have any questions? We have other uh, courses going on, webinars, uh, both Denture and uh, porcelain and CAD CAM and so forth. We do some, as Mark mentioned, uh, we do some uh, remote webinars also on the digital side of dentures as well. And Mark has been um, part of that as well, this ongoing um, uh, expansion of our Vita product line. Uh, those of you that may be interested in 2024, we have a couple workshops. These are uh, week. Uh, workshops that are two days work. The rest of the time is all play. If you want to venture out to Germany, go to the uh, factory. Vita Zon fa uh, um, Fabric uh, Factory and go through a training there a workshop with a couple of well-known uh, Vita trainers for dentures. That's available. So please contact us if you're interested in that. Uh, Mark has been gracious enough to provide us with uh, his contact information. So if you want to follow up with Mark on any questions you have, you can get a hold of him. He is a working um, denturist technician, uh, sees many patients. He's also traveling, doing lectures and workshops as well. So give him time to respond. And we will start with uh, a few questions. So uh, Mark is a technician. Uh, how would I know if the vertical needs to be changed? Are there signs? <laughs> no, 
you'll only know it when it doesn't work and the doctor's calling you or the case is coming back repetitively and, and they don't understand why what the problem is. That's when I share this with you to say, like when you get the bite from it, it and, and you're setting it up in the lab, there's really no way of knowing unless you know that it's say, for example, replacing a 19 year old really worn down denture. Then you can stop and say, dollars to donuts, was this over opened? Uh, most likely it was then given the age of the patient and the situation and we're trying to do that one to three millimeters and it's one to three posterior, not anterior. Um, so on the onset my answer is no it's going to be really hard for you to, to know that you'll only really know it when on all those trouble cases that are coming back consistently that's when you stop and can open communication and dialogue because this is becoming really expensive for everybody and frustrating for the patient but when you stop and consider your hourly rate the hourly operating cost of a dental office at 500 or five thousand dollars an hour that doctor stressed out on this and so that's why i'm bringing this to your attention so that you can be that conduit to help them figure this out and then they're going to be loyal to you from that dental technician's perspective okay I hope what about answers. mark what about um are there certain words or something that uh, when you have them speak, when the dentist or the denturist has a uh, patient speak, is there signs that can give you at least a, a guidance on whether it's open, closed, or? Well, part of that was, okay, so long-winded response. I, I look at their face form, and if I see their muscles sagging, then I know it's going to be more vertical, more freeway space based on their muscle tone and that's why i showed those pictures because because again the muscles are sagging beyond the ramus of the mandible so again at that snapshot of time their freeway space is going to be more than when they were when they were 20. when you have them speak i want to say days of the week and months of the year days of the week and months of the year in english and their mother language because those words days of the week and months of the year contain the building blocks of that language. And the building blocks are the phonetical enunciations. So in English, it's A-E-I-O-U. So that's moving your mandible. And then what I'm doing is I'm watching them speak. And then I'm watching that develop. So, so from that characteristic to answer Jim's question is yes, days of the week, months of the year. And you saw that in the video of, the, of my patient. So days of the week, months of the year to help assess that. But then again, I'm watching Remember, it's not one to three anterior, it's one to three posterior, and that's hard to see. We're always looking anterior, so it's four to six or more. Okay. Uh, another question, how do you handle a patient who's uh, used to the milling, to milling their food to now having cusp or a mortal pestle type, yes. which requires a different chew cycle? Yes, so now out of the factory Vita teeth, so specifically MFT, Lingoform, and Physiodens have one millimeter. So from the center, it's a half a millimeter in each direction of freedom and centric. So to counteract that, then on in the articulator, I can grind it more and I give them two millimeters of freedom and centric. So that box to land in as they're going through their cycle, I'm giving them a bigger pad to land in. And I can do that without damaging it because I'm just grinding, again, the, outs, the, the inner slopes of that bowl. And that's how I counteract that. It's been extremely effective and an aha moment of epic proportion for me to, to again, take someone from that horizontal milling and I can put them into mortar and pestle teeth. And all I'm doing is I just grind the bowl. Don't shorten it. Just widen it and they are efficient less chews it works awesome and it's stable and provides the stability for the lower that's my answer uh, should, it's extremely effective great. oh that's excellent so you shared a couple uh cases there with attachments so the question is um how much room do you need vertical do you need to 
uh, do a bar attachment case and what is your go-to attachment? Yeah, okay, so uh, yeah, I've, I've tinkered Zest and now I showed you some Nova locks and I, I got to work, I work with what I work with. Uh, I'm, I'm flexible from that. So, certainly on that case, the Nova lock was worked well on that case that I showed you because of the, the Nova lock has more of a ability of the 20 degree uh, rotational factor on it. So um, I don't have a preference. I, I, you know, again, there has to be so much vertical for you to fit the, the stuff in. And as the vertical goes down, it's harder to fit her in and strengthen it and stuff. So our jobs become really challenging. And if it's in, in some cases, I've had to ask that we that we vertically with the doctor who's placing the implants, we have to splint the patient open vertically first before any of this gets done because of the lack of vertical and space. It also depends on the doctor and how they're planing it and where they this, the depth that they place the implant in. And so these are things that, you know, I hate to say it, but communication becomes extremely important. Um, yeah. You know, and, and when you're dealing with these fifty or sixty thousand dollar cases, uh, yeah, the right hand and the left hand have to know what they're talking about, because the patient who's paying that fifty or sixty thousand doesn't want to hear excuses when it's done why it's not working. Uh, neither would I. So as a consumer, so uh, I, I get it. It's easy for me to say that. It's easy for me to say communication so i you know to answer the question i i don't have a preference this is what i i i'd use different things and that's why i asked i you know i okay nova lock is fine and i was thankful for the nova lock on that case that i showed you and it, it's worked and i just i had to think differently and that's why i didn't ask for the correction like that i'm you know it's just again it's been working <laughs> so you know, and that's why is I, I I acknowledge that there was a lever and how am I going to manage said lever? And that's how I did it. I left it and it, it's taken some of the stress off. And then again, with a proper bite and, and the flexibility, flexibility, that freedom of movement architecture. And again, through that chew cycle, it's not popping it off the implants. So that's how I've managed it. All right. Uh, that pre-denture, uh, do you use a pre-denture uh, for rehabilitation to open the vertical dimension? You can, and I have, yes. And that's where digital can come in because we can alter things on, you know, digitally and keep printing them off and they just wear that. I mean, in the good old days, I'd have to do it with the occlusion or, or, or on the splint therapy. And now with digital, it's, it's, you know, certainly another good tool in our tool belt. Just you want to remember, keep the freedom, keep some of the principles, the mortar and pestle principles in that design. And again, there's only a handful of product that has that. Vita is one of them. On my prescription, uh, the question is, uh, on the prescription I give to the dentist, should I start adding the uh, a two cycle diagram? Uh huh. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and I've helped I've helped dental labs develop that, and then the doctor circles it, and you just have to have that communication with the doctor. So you can private message me or, or contact me, and I can help you with that. Absolutely, I've developed that for offices. Uh, have a clinical guide. Yeah, absolutely, because then that helps you how to manipulate the articulator to set the teeth within that chew cycle in the efforts of counting of of reducing that adjustment. And when you explain that to the doctor, we're doing this because I know what's your running cost per hour. And he goes, well, it's $2,000. And you go, yeah, an adjustment's 30 minutes. So I'm going to save you that time. And that's why we're doing this. Remember, we're building the denture for the patient, not the patient for the denture. When I got my right. head around that and understood that all those years ago, man, my stress level went down because I got control of this. This is about being a superhero. People trust us. I trust my doctor. I trust my dentist. I trust my mechanic. Why? Because you trust them to look after you and care for you and not give you an excuse after when it doesn't work. Jim's smart. Uh, You're yeah. smiling, but it's so true, right? <laughs> I mean, it's so true. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. Yep. So you guys, we don't slap teeth together. Woot woot. We don't. 
And it, so we can do these small little things. That's why I wanted to show you about freedom of movement architecture and how this, you know, inside my head about how I manage this and then the products that I use that help me get there. Man, it's been a game changer for me. Uh, the post here, uh, freedom of movement, the question is, is it ideal for all class relationships? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just an understanding, though, of, of looking at their true cycle. But everyone has freedom and centric. It doesn't matter of the class. Everybody has freedom. Class one, two, or three, you have freedom and centric. And then there's a true cycle that goes with that freedom and centric. Absolutely. I use I use LingoForm on everything. And LingoForm is what the digital platform is based on for Vita through Vionic, which is their digital platform. And it's based on that for a reason. Uh, and the reason is, is that freedom of movement and, and, and again, through that true cycle. And this is kind of similar to the other question, but um, since it's up, up uh, how do I determine the patient is overclosed? Is there a... Well, okay, so you, how do you... Yeah, yeah, so how do you determine is that you don't see any teeth when the teeth are in? They're just thrusting forward like the old man. And then they're complaining about temporal mandibular joint issues. That's when you can say, yeah, they're overclosed. Okay. And but, uh, you know, but that lady that I showed you at the very, very onset of this presentation, she was not overclosed. I did not open that vertical. I just, I altered and positioned and, you know, did a couple little tricks here and there. It, I left her like that on purpose. Uh, but again, I can stand in front of a group of my peers and say, this is why I made these decisions. And again, that's what you trust your dental, or any professional to do when they make those decisions on your behalf. All right. Thank you. So if anybody else has some uh, further questions, uh, get them in now. Otherwise, we'll go to the next question now. Um, the case that you showed with the digital denture, um, what was it made out of? The one that you did, the, uh, I think they're talking about the one that you did the, uh, where they wore it during the night. You, yeah, you that was just did, a yeah. two shade resin material. No, that was, yeah, uh, yeah, that, resin, right? yeah, it's just two shade resin. Just print, uh, that was printed. That was just two shade resin material. Just okay. resin. And it just I, I, the, brand, the brand name, oh my gosh, I can't remember. Um, but it was just a standard resin two shade material. They wear that at night. Man, that has also been effective for her and managing the, the, the grinding in her situation. Super, super important. It's been, uh, again, we've extended the shelf life of the denture. She's very grateful. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, everyone, awesome. for joining us. Um, I appreciate all the time and all the knowledge you provided, everyone. It was really fantastic, and as always, uh, it's a great uh, wealth of knowledge that you share, and we're glad that you do share your, your knowledge. Again, if anybody does need to get a hold of Mark, uh, Mark is uh, providing his information, but again, if you contact him, whether it's email or phone, give him a chance to respond, because he is often out in the field and also seeing patients himself. So uh, any last-minute uh, comments you want to make? Mark, for we uh, just close again, this out. thanks, thanks to you, Jim, and to the kind support of Vita North America and all the efforts that go on behind the scenes to make these types of things happen. So thank you for your support of supporting us and our professions, and thanks everybody for joining in and taking a moment out of your busy days to help grow and be that superhero uh, to that patient, regardless of whether you see them directly or not. Uh, and again, I'm here to support you. So if you need me, contact me privately, and I'm here to offer the support that I can. Um, and then keep an eye on the, on that. And then again, you will receive a uh, feedback request form from Vita within a day or so, thanking you for attending this course and to provide any feedback. They do read that. Uh, and so it's important if please provide that feedback. And if you want in-person uh, in person training or in-person courses, let them know. Uh, they need to know that to help with their strategic planning as well. All right. Well, thank you very much. Awesome. Thank and you. thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today. And this will end today's uh, Vita, uh, Vita Academy webinar with Mark Wagonseal. Thanks again, Mark. And thank you, everyone, for Pleasure. joining us today. Have a good Bye, everybody. evening, day, wherever you're at.